today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling Oh come to title of my sermon is The Wrong Place, The Wrong People, The Wrong Time, and The Wrong Plan. And who better to preach it than me? And you think I'm kidding. I'm not. Seriously. This is the title. You know, and you might be thinking, why, why? Well, because my life has had plenty of these moments. It just It just has. Um, I'm reminded of a story back when I, it was about 2007 or 2008. As many of you know, I used to travel the world. I was an art auctioneer, so I was traveling a lot on the cruise ships. And there was uh, this one time we got off. I, I'd finished my, my contract, and so I got off um, in the French Riviera. A bunch of us decided to take a little vacation in Saint-Tropez. And which is basically a French Riviera. So if you, so while I was there, we met some, I met some other people. They were traveling, some other young people, and um, most of them were Middle Eastern. A couple of guys were Pakistani. They'd um, obviously been educated in England, London, so they had a British accent. And there was a whole bunch of us. And it was my last day there. And they said, "Hey, why don't you come down uh, with us tomorrow? We're going to go down to Cairns, and we're going to get on our friend's yacht, and we're going to go out." They're all very, very wealthy, okay? They're all like, their parents are bankers and oil and who knows what else. But uh, so I was like, no, I'm supposed to fly home. Uh, I, I, you know, I've got my flight flying home. And they're like, oh, don't worry about your flight. We'll take care of it. I'm like, you'll take care of it? I'm like, what does that mean? You know, they said, oh, if one of our friends has got a jet or a private plane, we'll get you a flight home. I'm like, private plane? Jet? International flight? So uh, I was like, hmm, let me think about it. Okay. So... Um, I went down with them all, like there was before about four of us, and we went down the next day, and we got to, down to Cairns, and we got on this huge yacht, we're still in the harbor, we get on this huge yacht, and there's some other people, and so I started talking to them, and there's this one girl, she's, you know, uh, probably early 20s, or so Middle Eastern, and I started talking with her, hey, so what are you doing here? She said, oh, my family, um, they've got a, um, like a condo up here. They, she pointed up to the hillside, so I'm staying in their condo. I'm like, oh, that's very nice, you know? She said, yeah. I said, so are you just staying here for the summertime? You've got to go back to school? Are you working? She said, no, I'm just waiting out the war in my country. I was like, oh, war in your country, that sounds, that's, that's sad. She's like, yeah, it's okay, you know, whatever. And we talked a little bit more, and I said, okay, well, you know, sorry, by the way, hi, I'm, I'm Cindy, so nice to meet you. And she said, hi, I'm Aliyah bin Laden. <laughs> How many have I had? <laughs> did, did, I'm sorry, did you, <clears throat> did you say bin Laden? She said, uh-huh. As in like Osama bin Laden? She said, yeah. Uh, like, uh, in my side of my head, I'm like, what do I say? What do I say? What do I say? I said, do you know, I said, Osama, so in relation, you're, she's like, he's my, my crazy uncle. I was like, do you know the whole world is looking for your uncle right now? She said, yeah, I know. He's crazy. We kind of like disowned him. I was like, kind of. 
I was like, I need to get off this yacht now, now, get me off the yacht. I was like, I just said to the guys, I gotta go, I gotta go, I gotta go right now, right now, I gotta get off the yacht. They're like, why? I was like, I just gotta go. I was like, all I could think is the CIA or overhead flying. I've seen a lot of 007 movies, okay? I was like, for sure, this is it. This is it, this is how I'm gonna get caught. They're gonna arrest everybody, it's gonna be a raid. I'm gonna be taken in for questioning. I don't do well under questioning. All you have to do is punch my toenail and I'll tell you anything. And I was like, I was just the wrong people. I didn't know she was Bin Laden's niece, I promise. So, you know, I get off the thing and I like rush to the airport. I was like, convince them to get me a new flight, you know. And the whole time I'm going through immigration, I'm like looking over my shoulder. I'm just waiting for somebody to pull me over because I was for certain this is how I end up in some hole because I was, you know, hanging out with the Bin Ladens. But so <laughs> that, was, uh, that was one of my stories there that uh, you just don't know sometimes who you're going to hang out with, the wrong people at the wrong place in the wrong time. And I managed to get out of there. But, uh, you know, there's a, when I read the Bible, there's a person that jumps out to me that's similar to that, and that is Jonah. And so today I'm gonna, we're going to talk through the story of Jonah. So if you turn to the book of Jonah in the Old Testament with me, Jonah chapter 1. Now Jonah was a prophet in the Old Testament, so God would speak to the prophets and then they would have to go and relay what God said. That's how it worked, all right? So we're going to read here Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it, because I have seen how wicked its people are. Now you might think, oh, the word of the Lord oh, it come, it came to him just because he's a prophet. But do you know that the word of the Lord comes to you every day? Do you know every time you read the Bible, that's the word of the Lord coming to you? So whether you're reading, oh, love your enemies, or forgive quickly, or if you're reading the fact that God's got a purpose and a plan and a destiny for you, that's the word of the Lord coming to you. We're also, we have the Holy Spirit in us, so the Holy Spirit also wants to talk to you. That's also the word of the Lord coming to you. That's if, as long as you will stop and listen, He wants to talk to you. And you might think, well, I, I, I don't hear God's voice. Well, if, you, if you're saved, then guess what? You did hear His voice, because that is Him calling to you. But, you know, I think we can learn something from this ancient book of Jonah in the year 2018. And that is sometimes when God speaks to us, he tells us things that we don't necessarily like. Or he asks you to do something that you don't necessarily want to do. Okay? So, <clears throat> I, was, I was watching as, um, tennis the other day. Um, I love tennis. I mean, I love Federer. <laughs> Let's just be honest. I mean, I love watching him play, Roger Federer. I'm totally getting in a hole here. But um, I was watching Roger Federer play. He's the greatest of all times. He just won his 20th Grand Slam. Hello. Huge fan. So uh, I was watching him play the other day, and uh, he was playing this, this poor guy who was had never been in a Grand Slam in his life. And here he is on the center court, you know, all these people screaming and cheering. And if, you, if you're familiar with tennis, they get what's called three challenges. The players do. So what happens is if, if they hit a ball and the umpire calls that ball out, they get to say, I'm going to challenge that. I, wanna, I think it went in. And they've got these cameras and the cameras come down and zoom in and they like, ooh, it was on the line. You know, so if they're wrong, then the, the call stands. And this poor guy that's playing Federer, I felt so bad for him. I mean, Federer is showing him what tennis is supposed to look like. And, you know, he is, every time the ball lands, if he thinks it's in, the umpire calls it out, he's like, challenge! You know, he's trying anything. He's like, that's wrong, you made a mistake. And then it's, no, you're right. Um, so I hear, everything is going against him, you know. But I was watching it and I thought to myself, you know, that's how we react to God sometimes. God tells us to do something, and we're like, no, 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 God, I'm sure that's a mistake, because you don't know my personality. That's not where I fit on the disc profile. I cannot go and talk to somebody, okay? That's just out of my comfort zone. I don't do that. You know, and so we challenge, we challenge God's call. You know, we think, we think, oh, that's okay, you know, I, 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 he must have made a mistake. But see, God is not a referee. He's not an umpire. He's not a human. His call, his command, his assignment, it's never wrong, it's never a mistake, and it's never debatable, which we don't want to hear. But, you know, I think there's a Jonah in all of us. You know, I mean, God might be speaking to you about some things that he wants you to change, 
or to give up or to start doing. You know, and we and we might be and you might be sitting here thinking, but I I have a va- I have a valid reason why I, I don't want to do it. Well, Jonah had a pretty valid reason why he didn't want to listen to God. I don't know if you know this, Nineveh. If we go back here, Nineveh uh, at the time was the capital city of Assyria. Okay, now Assyria was uh, very powerful, and they were known as a barbaric community. They would take over cities and they would cut the heads off the people, and they would make pyramids outside the city of men's heads. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> that's, he's like, that's gross. They were known for tor- torturing people, all right? So this is not somewhere you want to go. You got it? Now, for those of you that appreciate geography, Assyria is now called Iraq. And Jonah was from Israel. Sworn enemies. Not much has changed. But, okay, let's, to help you understand what God is asking him to do, what if God called you to go to preach to, I don't know, ISIS? Yeah, me running in the wrong direction. So let's not hate on Jonah, okay? Because I think there is a Jonah in all of us. And you might have a valid reason for not doing what God wants you to do. You know, maybe you're saying, God, I can't afford to pay my tithe because I can't afford to pay my rent. Or you might be saying, God's like, hey, I want you to bring your children to church. And you're saying, but God, they play sports on Sundays and they're really good. I can't bring them to church. Or whatever the reason is, you might think in your mind that you have a very valid reason for not listening to God. So you're kind of like in this like delayed obedience you know, like when, like when a parent talks to their child and they're like, Danny, stop doing that. One, two, you know, you're, you're like looking up at God going like two and a half, two and three quarters. Like you're like hoping he's going to change his mind or he's going to tell you he's going to suddenly decide to give you something that you want to do. You could be waiting a long time. But you know, if God is giving you an assignment, if he's asking you to do something, you know what? It's probably not just for your benefit. It's actually probably for the benefit of those around you, maybe your workplace, who knows, maybe even your city. The end result of obedience with God is always better than you could imagine. So let's keep reading. So Jonah chapter 1 verse 3. So God has told him, get up, go and, you know, talk to, uh, tell him about my judgment. So verse 3, Jonah, so Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa, where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket and went on board, hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. I find this hilarious. Okay, he's a prophet. He gets it, the almighty God. And he is trying to hide from God. Like he's going to find a place where God be like, Where did he go? (laughs) Jesus, you seen Jonah anywhere? (laughs) Seriously, but he tries. So if the prophet of God is going to try and run from God, how much more do we? And don't you find that there's always a boat heading in the wrong direction? I mean, as soon as you make that decision, that resolution, I'm going to eat healthy. It's free pizza and cake day at your work. (laughs) You make the decision, that's it today. I'm going to start saving. And you get an email about the biggest shoe sale ever. Right, Jen? (laughs) You make a commitment, I'm going to Bible college. And you get the best job offer, but you have to work Monday nights. When God calls you to do something, there will always be the option to get on the boat going in the wrong direction. There'll always be two voices that you hear. One will be God's, the other will be the Jonah in you. And the voice you respond to will determine the future you experience. So choose wisely when listening. My pages are stuck. Sorry, there we go. Continue reading. We're going to continue. Jonah chapter 1 and verse 4. So, but the Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. Fearing for their lives, the desperate sailors shouted to their gods for help and threw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. 
But all this time, Jonah was sound asleep down in the hold. So the captain went down after him. How can you sleep at a time like this? He shouted. Get up and pray to your God. Maybe he will pay attention to us and spare our lives. Do you ever notice that when you're in the, your delayed obedience, that the first thing to go is prayer? When you're like, oh, I'm not sure I want to do that exactly. The first thing you do is stop talking to God, right? Continue reading verse 7. Then the crew cast lots to see which of them had offended the gods and caused this terrible storm. When they did this, the lots identified Jonah as the culprit. Why has this awful storm come down on us, they demanded. Who are you? What is your line of work? What country are you from? What is your nationality? Like, just tell us, what have you done? Jonah answered, I'm a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea, hence the storm, and the land. The sailors were terrified when they heard this, for he had already told them he was running away from the Lord. Oh, why did you do it? They groaned. And since the storm was getting worse all the time, they asked him, what should we do to you to stop the storm? Throw me into the sea, Jonah said, and it will become calm again. I know that this terrible storm is all my fault. I want to preach uh, for a minute from the sailor's point of view. See, here they are going about their business, minding their own thing, not causing any trouble. And suddenly they find themselves in a storm that they were never meant to be in. They're facing the storm because of one man's disobedience. One person's rebellion can bring down a whole boatload of people. See, these guys had checked the weather before they got on the boat. There was no storm up ahead. Now they're fearing for their lives. They're scared. The wind is blowing. They think, this is how I'm going to die. They're in the wrong place, the wrong time, all because of the wrong person, Jonah. There are going to be times in your life where you are not the problem. That perhaps the storm you're facing in your life is because there is a Jonah in your boat. Maybe the problem that you're facing is because the people you're hanging around with. Their rebellion against God, their disobedience, their unwillingness to follow the Lord is causing a storm and you're so close you're getting sucked into it. It's time to throw that Jonah off your boat or at least get them out of your life. You might be thinking, oh, I need to take care of them. God will take care of them. Just like God's about to take care of Jonah. He's like, no, let God be God. Kick them out the boat. God will be there to take care of them. See, the wrong people, the wrong place, the wrong plan get you in a lot of, pro get you in a lot of trouble. Um, when, the story, the, or the summer, should I say, the summer of my, the summer that I turned 21 um, was a memorable one for my parents. <laughs> Pretty much a, a blur for me. Some of you will get that on your way home. Um, <laughs> But I had this friend, uh, uh, and she, she, you know, have you ever had those friends that just trouble just comes with them? This was her. So she came to stay with us um, over the summer, and uh, it was long, long weeks for my parents of her staying with us. But uh, the very last day she was there, we were supposed to drive back, my brother in his car and her and I in her new car. We would drive back. We were in college at the time in Old Roberts University in Oklahoma. So we told my parents that morning that we had to go down and drop this bag off at these guys that we've been hanging out with all summer back at their house and say goodbye and then we'd be back to, to go on the road. So we left and um, the hours went by and we weren't back and this was, you know, we didn't have cell phones and the hours are going by and now we're super late. And uh, when we finally arrive home, I'm going to tell the story from my dad's perspective, because it's much funnier this way. So I'll tell you the story, what happened from his side, and then I'll tell you what really happened. So, <laughs> so we, we pull up in the driveway, and we just, we're so late. We're like, just, let's just honk the horn, and we'll just, Hane will come out, and we'll just leave. We're not going to get out the car and say the goodbyes. Are you kidding? Do you know my family? There's so many hugs and kisses and hugs and kisses and prayers and hugs and kisses. There's no way you can get a honk the horn and get in the car and drive away. So first of all, we pull up, we honk the horn. My dad's out there in the driveway like this. 
because we're like super late. So we, we go inside the house and we sit down and my dad is like, he has had it. This whole summer, he has been waiting to give us a lecture and here it comes. And he's like, you are running after these boys and what are you doing? And your life is all off track. And the two of us, eventually my brother and my mom, they like walk up to the bathroom because they're like, we're not going to be near this conversation. You know, hell and brimstone is coming down right now. And my friend and I are sitting there. <laughs> And my friend and I are sitting there. We're not saying a word, right? And so my dad is like laying, this is not godly way. And, da -da -da, and he's giving us a speech. <laughs> and, and now the tears are streaming down our face. And he is like, I am getting through to these girls. That is it. They are crying. They're not even speaking back. I am telling them like it is. You know, and so by the end of this, it's like, okay. You know, he's like, hug everybody goodbye. We still have not said a word, just crying and shaking our heads, you know, in agreement. So he gives us big hugs and everything else and sends us on our way and we drive off and we stopped at the first gas station and um, Hank gets out the car, my brother, and he's like, what is going on with you guys? And we're still crying and he's like, wow, you guys are still crying and we're like, <gasps> and we open our mouths. We'd gotten our tongues pierced. <laughs> and we didn't know that your tongue swells to like three times the size of your mouth and it's excruciating painful. So we couldn't talk back. And we were in so much pain, we literally had to suck ice cubes for the next 24 hours to our drive back to Tulsa. So yeah, my dad, when he found out, he laughed so hard, he cried. Like he was like, he couldn't believe that's actually what happened. But yeah, we, there was no talking back because we couldn't dare. Like, oh, we were. So yeah, that's what happens when you hang around with the wrong people, the wrong place. You get in a lot of trouble. But you know, that's it. Sin, sin will always take you where you don't want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. You, you need to be intentional with the people you hang around with, okay? I will tell you that that girl now is serving the Lord with all her heart, so <laughs> we have to bump in the road. Or in the tongue, whatever. Verse Verse 13, let's keep reading. So verse 13, so instead, so now the sailors are like, wait, we're not going to throw this guy overboard. We can't kill him. So what do they say? Instead, the sailors rowed even harder to get the ship to land. But the stormy sea was too violent for them and they couldn't make it. See, this is this is perfect example of this is when you think you can prosper while in your sin. God said, do something, and they're like, nope, not going to do that, but let's prosper anyway. No, God says, get rid of that relationship. No, I'm going to keep it, but you want me to bless it anyway? Mm. So verse 14, then they cried out to the Lord, Jonah's God, oh Lord, they pleaded, don't make us die for this man's sin and don't hold us responsible for his death. Oh Lord, you've sent the storm up upon him for your own good reasons. Then the sailors picked up Jonah and threw him into the raging sea, and the storm stopped at once, the sailors were awestruck by the Lord's great power, and they offered him a sacrifice and vowed to serve him. Now the Lord had arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. I would say at this point, the quality of Jonah's life has taken a turn for the worst. <laughs> okay, it's the belly of a whale. But you know, that's what happens. The quality of our lives is in direct proportion to our willingness to submit and obey God's sovereignty. What do I mean by that? A few months ago, I can't remember when it was, I was sitting outside a Starbucks or, or coffee shop waiting for somebody to come in, and next to it was this little like barber hair salon kind of place. And these two little boys walked out with their mom. One was about three or four, the other one was about seven. And the seven-year-old walked out, cutest little haircut ever you've ever seen. The three-year-old walked out, looked like they let the seven-year-old cut his hair. I mean, it was all like over the place. The cut here, hung here, down short, shaved, half shaved in the back. I was like, what happened? And I was like, you know, this, this, this right here is a lesson in obedience. Because when the, when the barber said, turn your head to the right, the seven-year-old was like, mm-hmm. Turn your head to the left, look down, look up. He obeyed. However, from the way the three-year-old was carrying on to the car, I could tell that he did not obey. He did everything in his power not to obey. But see, if you had just looked at those children, if you just looked at that little kid's haircut, what's your first reaction? You're going to blame the barber. 
you're going to say this is clearly a, ref a reflection on the skill of the hairdresser. Instead, it's a reflection on the kid's obedience or lack thereof. See, the quality of our lives sometimes has little to do with the skill of God, but rather it's possibly a commentary on your obedience to the sovereignty in your life, to His sovereignty in your life. Are you willing to be obedient to His sovereignty? Are you going to listen when He says, go right, and you say, no, I'm going to go left? He says, go up, you say, no, I'm going to go down. Could it be that the quality of your life is not blamed on the skill of God, but rather on whether you're being obedient to Him or not? Two things that God desires from us, and that is faith and obedience. Both are required. So back to Jonah. So Jonah basically he comes to his senses in the whale. He prays. He asks God for forgiveness. The fish spits him out on dry land. And here we are. So we pick up reading Jonah chapter 3 verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I have given you. See, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. How many have ever had God come to them a second time? Or an eighth? Or a 45th? See, God isn't the God of a second chance. He's the God of another chance. And another chance. And another chance. Say, God is patient with me. You know, and I, I see from the story that God is not just concerned with the mission. He's concerned with the messenger as well. Because, you know, God could have abandoned Jonah. When Jonah said, oh, I don't want to do this, God could abandon him. He found another prophet. I mean, God, God's, used, God's like, God could have said, hey, I've used bushes. I use donkeys. I can get the word out any way I want. I don't need you. But he doesn't. He sticks with them because I, you see that Jonah teaches us that God doesn't just use people to complete his mission, but rather he uses the mission to complete his people. So, so as you, he's not just asking you to do something, an assignment, or to fix something in your character. You think, oh, why do I have to do this just for those people? No. In doing that thing, you will find fulfillment. He will be able to develop your character. He'll be able to strengthen your faith. He'll be able to make you feel loved and needed and wanted. So in doing the mission, he completes you at the same time. Whatever he is asking you to do, trust me, there's always a fulfilling reward attached to it. Tithing opens the windows of heaven over you. Witnessing to your barista at Starbucks. <laughs> Starbucks in the house, represent. You know, you witness to him and you never know who that person's going to touch. You don't know who they're going to reach out. Maybe they'll be the next Billy Graham just because you were bold enough. You don't know who they're going to touch. You know, and, and forcing your children to come to church on Sundays. By show of hands, how many were forced to go to church as a child? See, look at that. And they're all alive still. <laughs> and guess what? In church. That reward will pay off long into eternity. And you know, the, the story finishes where Jonah goes to the great city of Nineveh. He preaches, and 120,000 people get saved. 120,000 people get saved because of his obedience. I wonder whose lives are waiting on the other side of your obedience. What can't you see? What reward is there for you being obedient? Whose lives are waiting to be touched because they're waiting for you to be obedient? If we could only stop running, stop being in our delayed obedience, stop trying to hide, stop trying to choose our will over His, and realize that God always has your best interest at heart. If He's asking you to do something, trust me, it is because He loves you more than anything you could possibly imagine, and He knows this is actually going to be good for you. And you know, whatever comes from, whatever comes from the love of God has the grace of God as its companion. What do I mean? I mean that if God is asking you to give up something or to start doing something or to go on an assignment, whatever He's asking you to do, His grace will be attached to that. 
So when you step out in that obedience and say, I'm going to do this, God. I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to do this. Guess what? His grace will carry you through it. His grace will enable you to do it. His grace will be there with you. You're not going to do this on your own. Whatever he's asking you to do, trust me, there is great reward in doing it. But you know, it doesn't matter if maybe you're sitting here today and you've messed up or you've pulled away or you've run away or maybe you feel like, You're in the belly of a whale. Our God is the God of another chance. And he is calling you and telling you he's waiting and he is the God of another chance.